today's class, we're going to look at examples of how to use the best fit theory. Uh, before we start, I just want to point out that when you draw a molecule, for example, if you draw in methane here, um, the straight lines represent bonds that are in the plane of the blackboard, or the whiteboard. Uh, the triangular shape means that it's coming out at you. The, uh, the, the hatched shape means it's going behind the plane of the board. So to do a Lewis structure is the first step in obtaining a correct geometry. So you have to know how to draw a Lewis structure properly as a first step. Then you find the steric number of the molecule, meaning how many different groups are attached to the central atom. We count both lone pairs and bonding pairs as groups. Then we choose the appropriate shape. Oh, so, sorry, also you have to say how many lone pairs are present. So the steric number is the total number of things attached. But you have to know how many lone pairs there are because that helps you determine what the shape is going to be ultimately. So you choose the appropriate shape. We have a, from yesterday's notes, we have a chart that tells us what all the different shapes are based on the steric number and the number of lone pairs. Fourthly, uh, if you're asked to assess the polarity of the molecule, you have to use two criteria. The first is, you have to check for the polarity of the bonds. And I, I've taken the liberty of writing the electronegativity series that helps you decide whether which molecules are the most polar. Um, fluorine is the most polar element. Metals are the least polar. I haven't made um, a complete list, but these are the ones that occur most often. So Funkel, Burke, Huff, metals is a way of memorizing it. So fluorine is being the most electronegative, metal being the least. Uh, and the, the other thing that destroys a polarity of a, mol a molecule overall is symmetry. If you have a symmetrical molecule, even though the bonds are polar, the symmetry will cause the vectors of the dipoles to cancel out. So overall, the molecule can be nonpolar, even though it's composed of polar bonds. So the first example we look at here is PCL3. Here's the accounting of the number of electrons in PCL3. It's Phosphorus is a group 15 element, so it has five valence electrons. Chlorine is a group 17 element, and it has each chlorine atom has seven valence electrons. The way you find out the number of valence electrons is subtract 10 from the group number if it's on the right side of the periodic table. And there are three chlorine atoms, so 21 plus 5 is 26 electrons. So here we've drawn a Lewis structure. Notice how there are six valence electrons on each chlorine atom. And um, each bond counts for 2, so 3 times 6 gives you 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. So there's 26 electrons count, accounted for. This molecule has a steric number of 4 because there are 1, 2, 3, 4 things attached to the central atom with one lone pair. And that tells us that it's a pyramidal shape. One way of drawing a pyramidal shape is to make it look like a stool. You have two chlorine atoms coming out at you and one chlorine atom be going behind the plane of the blackboard. I like to draw the lone pair as a, as a ghost. If you want to show uh, the polarity of the molecule, you can redraw the molecule so that the, uh, the two bonds here are in the plane of the blackboard. So you basically tilt the molecule up so that the chlorine atom that is facing back is now pointing directly, almost directly back. And then you can more easily display the, uh, the dipoles. And the way you show a dipole is you point the, the point of the arrow points towards the more electronegative element. Chlorine is more electronegative than phosphorus, so you point the arrowhead towards the chlorine, you put a little plus sign on the, on the phosphorus side. So the net dipole is the result of all, all these three vectors pointing downwards, and so the net, the net vector is downwards. So this is a polar molecule. It's composed of polar bonds, and the molecule itself is polar because symmetry does not cancel out the dipoles. The second example is uh, sulfur dichloride. We've done the accounting. Sulfur has six electrons, chlorine has seven, two chlorine atoms. So the total number of electrons is 20. Here's the uh, preliminary Lewis structure. Steric number is four, one, two, three, four things attached, two of which are a lone pair. That tells us the molecule is angular planar. I then redrew it with so the lone pair looking like ghosts, and the, um, the chlorine atoms are more electronegative than sulfur, so the dipoles point towards chlorine. The resultant dipole is pointing down between the legs of the, of the bonding pairs, as, as it were. So the molecule does have a net dipole. So the bonds are polar, the molecule is not symmetrical, so the, pole, the dipoles don't cancel. So overall, the molecule is polar. Silicon tetrafluoride. 
Silicon has four valence electrons. Fluorine has seven. There are four fluorine atoms. Total number of electrons is 32. It looks like methane. Same, same geometry. It's there at number four. No lone pairs. It's a tetrahedral. And because it's a tetrahedral, it's symmetrical. So the dipoles cancel. You can imagine that these two dipoles have a resultant dipole pointing up. These two dipoles, which are arranged at a 90 degree angle to the first two, so these two are like this and these two are like that, their net dipole is pointing down. So if you have one pointing up and one pointing down, the net uh, dipole is zero. So this molecule, although it has polar bonds, is nonpolar because of symmetry. So the symmetry, um, the bonds in SIF4 are polar, but due to the molecule's symmetry, the dipoles cancel out, and overall, the molecule is nonpolar. In the next example, we show uh, xenon dichloride. Now, you might think, well, xenon is a noble gas, so it doesn't form compounds, and uh, you would be correct in saying that you won't find something like that in nature, but they can be forced to form under the right conditions. They're not very stable substances, but they're they're interesting from the standpoint of the geometry that evolves, so they are listed here. Xenon dichloride, uh, when you count the number of valence electrons, you get 8 to xenon, 7 to chlorine, total is 22 electrons. So when you draw the preliminary structure, xenon is the central atom with a bond to each chlorine atom. You have 6 valence electrons uh, as lone pairs on each chlorine atom. So we have 2, 4, 6. 6 times 2 is 12. 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. 22 electrons are accounted for. Three lone pairs on xenon. So that gives it a steric number of five with three lone pairs. And uh, the, the table I gave you yesterday suggests that would be a linear arrangement. When you draw the geometry of the molecule, you end up putting the, the lone pairs equatorially, and the chlorine atoms are eggshell. So it forms a straight line. And because you cannot see the lone pairs when you do X-ray crystallography, uh, the molecule is linear, it's seen as linear, although it has a trigonal bipyramidal geometry because the steric number is 5. The bonds are polar, but in this case what happens is one chlorine atom has a dipole pointing up, the other chlorine atom has a dipole pointing down, so those two dipoles cancel, and overall the molecule is nonpolar. This interesting molecule iodine trichloride uh, gives rise to three different possible geometries and I want to do the analysis of it so we can see how to decide which the correct which one of the correct geometries to choose or which one of the three geometries is the correct one. Uh, here we do the accounting for the number of valence electrons. Iodine has seven valence electrons. Chlorine is also seven. There are three chlorines. So the total number of valence electrons is 28. We draw iodine as a central atom. We put each one of the chlorine atoms as satellites. There are six uh, lone pairs on each, um, sorry, there are three lone pairs on each chlorine atom, six electrons. So that gives you 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28 electrons accounted for in the Lewis structure. With a steric number of five, because there are one, two, three, four, five things attached, and two of them are lone pairs, that suggests a trigonal bipyramidal, uh, bipyramidal, uh, bipyramidal, let me try that again, trigonal bipyramidal shape but because two of them are not visible, it's actually called T-shaped. But how do we choose which geometry to draw? Here are the three possibilities that you can, you can draw. You can draw it so that two lone pairs are equatorial, only one lone pair is equatorial, or no lone pairs are equatorial. But which one is the most stable structure? We have to keep in mind that lone pair-lone pair interactions are highly unfavorable because lone pairs like to take up a lot of room, especially if they're at 90 degrees to each other. Uh, followed by lone pair bonding pair interactions, followed lastly by bonding pair bonding pair interactions. So anytime you have a molecule with lone pair lone pair interactions, you're almost, uh, you, you can be sure it's not a favorable geometry. Uh, also note that it has been observed that even lone pair lone pair interactions fall off dramatically once the bond angle uh, in increases beyond 90. So when you put the things equatorial, the bond angles are 120. Because you have three things in a circular um, arrangement, so the angle between each one is going to be 120. The axial ones are 180 degrees to each other, but they're 90 degrees to the equatorial bonds. So what we have to do is an accounting to see how many interactions you have in each molecule. If you look at the first arrangement, you have four lone pair bonding pair interactions. 
you look at this bonding pair, uh, this lone pair, it interacts with this bonding pair and it interacts with this bonding pair. So that's two interactions with this one. This lone pair, which is equatorial, is interacting with this one, this bonding pair, and that bonding pair. So there's a total of four lone pair bonding pair interactions in this arrangement. If we look at this arrangement where we put one electron equatorially and one axially, there's a 90 degree interaction between two lone pairs. So that's considered a no-no. There's one lone pair, lone pair interaction. And this lone pair also has um, one 90 degree lone pair bonding pair interaction. And this one has two, this one and that one. Okay, so this, this lone pair interacts with these two bonding pairs, which are equatorial. So this one has one lone pair, lone pair interaction, and three lone pair bonding pair. So out of these two possibilities, four lone pair bonding pair, or three lone pair bonding pair plus one lone pair, lone pair, obviously this is the more stable arrangement. So, so far this molecule is looking like the, the more stable of the two. Let's look at the fourth possibility. In the fourth possibility, we put the um, two lone pairs axially. So there are, with this one, there are three lone, lone pair bonding pair interactions with the three equatorial bonding pairs. And with this lone pair, there are also three lone pair bonding pair interactions. So we have a total of six lone pair bonding pair interactions in this geometry, which obviously is two more than this geometry. So again, this molecule has more lone pair bonding pair interactions than this one, and therefore compares, this one compares favorably. This is the most stable arrangement. So in, in, um, in conclusion, the, the molecule with the least number of unfavorable interactions is the most stable configuration. All three geometries depict the trigonal bipyramidal uh, configuration, but the one with the fewest lone pair, lone pair, and lone pair bonding pair interactions has both of, um, is the most favorable. I forgot to put that in. The first example is the correct one then. Now let's look at the polarity of the molecule. If we were to take this molecule and redraw it so that these two chlorine atoms are still arranged this way, and then we take this chlorine atom that, that's paint pointing at the back, we turn the molecule so that it's also in the plane of the blackboard, the molecule would look like this. And then the two equatorial um, lone pairs would be sticking out, one, one facing forward, one facing more towards the back. But it allows us to show the dipoles more clearly. Chlorine is more electronegative than iodine, so we'll point the dipoles towards the chlorine atoms. These two dipoles cancel, but this one doesn't. So overall, the molecule is polar because of that. Continuing now, two more examples. We have tellurium tetrafluoride. Six valence electrons in tellurium, uh, seven in fluorine, so a total of 34 electrons. Uh, when we draw the Lewis structure, we find that there's one lone pair on tellurium. So it's got a steric number of five, one lone pair, that gives you a seesaw configuration. And then when we draw it, we see uh, that we have one up, one down, one forward, one back, and the lone pair is uh, one forward. The resultant polarity, these two will cancel. But the resultant for the uh, dipoles of these two molecules is pointing that way. And I've, I've taken the liberty of redrawing it uh, so that you can see it more easily. Uh, if you draw it like a seesaw, where the, these are the two legs, and this is the part where you would sit on, the lone pair is pointing straight up. You can see that the resultant dipole is pointing down between the legs of the seesaw. So this molecule has polar bonds, and because it doesn't have symmetry, the bonds, the, the polarity doesn't cancel. So overall, the molecule is also polar. Lastly, we have PCL5 with a total of 40 electrons. Uh, no lone pairs, so a steric number of five, you get a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. But due to symmetry, due to symmetry, the molecule is nonpolar.